Many piano teachers believe that Hainan exercises are very primitive, stupid, horrible piano pieces that were composed solely with the purpose of torturing children and killing any sign of musicality in them. Of course, I don't know intentions, true intentions of uh, Hainan. Maybe he kept that in mind, who knows. But I make this course not because I want promote them uh, and I believe that everyone must play them. Of course not. Of course we can master all the necessary uh, piano, uh, piano playing skills from other pieces that we play. But I'm very much against judgmental thinking and jumping into conclusions. Answering to such unambiguous critique, I would say that if you can't play or teach a hand on exercise in such a way that it would improve both technical and musical aspects of piano playing, and would sound nothing less but truly beautiful, it means that most probably you can't play or teach anything properly. And in my demonstration I will hopefully prove that even from these seemingly primitive exercises we can benefit incredibly much also as musicians and can learn and should learn a lot of very useful, very necessary things like phrasing, working with motifs and most important finding and conveying the meaning of music. And I am absolutely sure that for those students who want to improve not only their technical skills but also to become better, more profound musicians, some points from today's demonstration might be actually a revelation. So before we proceed to a practical part, allow me to briefly cover a couple of uh, issues, a couple of topics. So people often ask me which exercises are better and what do I think about these or those exercises. So there is, first of all, there is no universal answer to everyone because each of us is a different person. So the task and responsibility of a teacher actually to assign repertoire and to choose which exercises or which pieces would be better, would be best suitable for this particular situation, for this particular student. But if to speak generally, it doesn't really matter that much what you play. You can play exercises by Hainon or Dornani or start uh, right away with some easier exercises by Czerny or something completely else. It doesn't really matter. The most important that uh, the pieces or exercises that you play would be more or less on your level. Well, let's say on the upper limit of your level. So they would nevertheless um, allow you to grow, but they shouldn't be too difficult, of course. And what is much more important is how we play them. So that's why uh, it's really great if you have a proper instruction, if you have a person who can give you a proper and regular feedback. So quite often we fall into logical traps of thinking, thinking that in order to progress, let's say in piano playing, we need to play only absolutely the best, the most genius uh, pieces. It's not exactly like that. It's like thinking that in order to become a better photographer, you just need the best camera available on the market up to date, or th that uh, becoming a better driver, you just need to buy the fastest car. But actually it's other way around. In order to feel safe in the fastest car in the world, you should first master the skills on, on a, some moderate model. If you would choose your pieces wisely, so they would allow you to develop different piano playing skills, then you would not need, of course, many exercises. You can develop all these skills uh, directly from uh, repertoire pieces that you play. But exercises, in my opinion, e are absolutely great for beginners when reading and learning skills are not yet well developed, when it takes a considerable amount of time to learn a piece. With exercises like Hainan, for example, you can start working on your technique immediately because it doesn't really take much time to understand and to read these structures. They're very, very basic. Quite often people also compare them with Brahms exercises and uh, they criticize Hainan for being very primitive anti-musical and they point on uh, Brahms uh, set of exercises that are so beautiful and help you to develop musicality eventually. Well here I have to say that if you don't know what you're doing you will not benefit from Brahms exercises because playing just genius works uh, without understanding how to approach them doesn't improve your musicality on its own. And overall I find this comparison not really appropriate because these sets of exercises are so incredibly different. First of all, Brahms exercises are 
not designed for beginners, in my personal opinion. I think that they are designed for transforming and polishing your piano technique. So first you have to build a solid base and then start transforming your technique in that way that is promoted in Brahms exercises. So in other words, you can't start building balcony before you build a house. So if you would approach them before you're actually ready uh, for that, you would most probably just damage your piano playing. I hope to make a comprehensive course on uh, Brahms exercises uh, in the nearest future, so stay tuned for that. And if you don't have a proper instruction at the moment, if you don't have a teacher who could help you with them, at least wait until I will release the course on them. And another point that Brahms exercises, in my opinion, are actually very specific, so they are great for romantic music if you play Chopin or Schumann or Tchaikovsky, that kind of aesthetics. But if you play Bach or Mozart or something modern, some technically aggressive language like by Prokofiev or Stravinsky or something similar, these technical principles that are promoted and developed in Brahms exercises might be actually quite irrelevant to another aesthetics, another types of music. So they are beautiful, they are very useful, but they are not easy, not suitable for beginners and, and not universal. So they help you develop certain skills for certain type of music. While Hanon exercises are very simple, they are very basic and they are perfectly suitable for beginners. So you can start working on them from day one. So in the first exercise we have the most basic pattern. We just press five fingers one by one. And we skip one note in the beginning, going from C to E and we return to D. And then we replace other four fingers, move them to the next position, and so on. So that's very basic. But nevertheless, it's not as easy as it might seem because we use fingers, five fingers, and all of them are very different. Some of them very strong, but short. Some of them short, but weak. Some of them long but weak and some of them long but strong. <laughs> so as you see, each finger is quite unique. And in order to achieve maximum equality in them, we have to consider some efficiency strategies. So the first strategy calls in and out technique. It means that while pressing different fingers, we move our hand sometimes in the keyboard, like further along the keys and sometimes out of the keyboard. So closer to the end of the keys. And this helps us to accommodate all these fingers that are so different. So the first finger is quite short. That's why we use a very small, but nevertheless noticeable movement in the keyboard. These fingers, two, three, they are very long. And for them, like if I would play them here, you see that's a very tight spot, even for me, although my fingers are relatively thin, but that spot is nevertheless very uncomfortable for me. So for these fingers, I'm going to go out of the keyboard. You see, I'm pulling my hand back. I'm pulling my elbow back actually. And that helps me to accommodate these fingers on the most comfortable spot of the keyboard. And then we have fingers four and five. Well, fourth finger is a disaster. If you have a weak fourth finger, uh, please don't be upset because that's a general humanity problem. There is no person with a strong fourth finger because this finger is dependent. You can see it's just not as independent as all the other fingers. It always goes together with neighbor fingers. That's why in order to reinforce this finger, we use movement in the keyboard. And here, look what happens. I go out of the keyboard and then if I would just press fourth finger, I would feel a lot of weakness here in this metacarpal joint. It is very important. Its stability is very important for piano playing. So in order to reinforce this joint and to get stability in that finger, I am going to push my hand forward right at the moment of the hit. So out of the keyboard, then in the keyboard. And you see that how this knuckle immediately gets stability and this is exactly what I want. While doing that movement in the keyboard, it's very important to avoid movement of the wrist. So 
this is not correct. Because in this case, you get tension in the wrist. So the wrist is always neutral. It's always more or less on the level with the keys. And this movement in the keyboard movement, it's really small. So you see, so at the end, when you minimize and optimize it properly, it's almost not visible even. But nevertheless, it makes a huge difference. So out of the keyboard, in the keyboard. And I continue that movement in the keyboard for the fifth finger in order to reinforce that finger as well, because this is also a very common problem, this collapsing uh, knuckle of the fifth finger. In order to reinforce both these fingers, we do a very small but steady and constant movement in the keyboard. And then we slowly gradually go out of the keyboard for the longer uh, for the longer fingers and for the thumb we again go in the keyboard so this synchronization is very important here in order to achieve maximum stability and equality in fingers so in the keyboard out in the keyboard out in the keyboard out in the keyboard so fingers 1, 4 and 5 are played on the movement in the keyboard and fingers 2 and 3 are played on the movement out of the keyboard. So this is what happens when I optimize all the movements. Mm. Now you might notice that all fingers sound pretty equal, so you don't feel that some fingers are weaker. And this is exactly the sensation in my hand. While playing like that, I feel that all fingers are equally strong. I don't have the feeling that some fingers are weaker than the others. Of course, piano playing is uh, always a combination of movements, so this is not the only movement that is important here. Another um, strategy that helps us optimizing our movements is called double and single rotations, brilliantly observed and described and promoted by Taubman's method. And uh, I, I really suggest you to learn more about that. I'm not going to speak about this in this video because that's a quite complex theme and I, I'm going to cover that in detail, uh, speaking about the second exercise um, in the course that you might find following the link in the description. In order to uh, avoid this percussiveness and in order to be able to sing on piano, we have to work on two aspects of piano playing. First of all, it's of course touch. It's uh, how we produce the tone. And second aspect is phrasing, how we organize a few notes into a phrase that would sound meaningfully and beautifully. And here's very important, one of the most important uh, tips that is uh, relevant to most of piano literature actually is that we have to perceive these motifs not the way they are written because if we would look at the score w what we see actually we have many groups of four notes so we even just visually we, we see these groups like one two three four one two three four one two three four one two three four all these looks like lego like you know bricks that are laying one after the other. But if we would play following these bricks, we would inevitably sound very vertical. Now you see that you can feel those impulses. I mark beginnings of each group because that's that makes sense. Yes, I see that and I play that. But if I want to sound as a musician, I have to perceive this music differently. So what we are going to do here, we are going to phrase this music from the second note, not from the first one. So I'm pressing the first note and I immediately release my wrists. I just release my wrists and then we start playing till the, till the first note of the next bar and then again. And now immediately you can feel that we have some shape that we have some melody that is well rounded. And I remember uh, very well when I have started playing piano, I had a 
fantastic music teacher, my first music teacher. She's an exceptionally good teacher. And what she was doing with us, she was always turning these notes into um, songs. So here we might find suitable phrase that would reveal the musical meaning of this phrase. For example, one, we separate the first note and then we start our song. I love you too, I love you too. I love you too, I love you too. I love you too, I love you too. And if you sing like that, you might immediately feel the shape of that melody. You might immediately feel how it should be played in order to sound convincing, in order to sound beautiful. And you might notice that there is no accent, there, there are no accents at all. We make a very rounded shape at the top of the phrase. I love you too, I love you too. But the end of the phrase will be softer. And the end of the phrase is basically the, the first note of the, of the next bar. What is really beautiful about this uh, approach is that it allows us to evolve, to develop this music uh, as it is, would be written in spirals. So we always go on the other uh, level. I love you too, I love you too, I love you too, I love you too. And you constantly feel that development. You don't feel static beats. You don't feel that music is distributed between some kind of boxes. You feel that it, it's, it keeps moving constantly, keeps evolving. Of course, you can find other words, for example, spaghetti, pasta, and fondue. Spaghetti, pasta, and fondue. Spaghetti, pasta, and fondue. And if, if that makes you more excited, actually. But at any case, you might notice that we never uh, speak like, I love you too, I love you too, I love you too, I love you too. So we never accent the last um, sound in a phrase if we want to speak really expressively, if we want that uh, a person would believe that we love them. Because if somebody would uh, talk to me like that, I love you too, I love you too, I would rather be freaked out. I would really start worrying very much <laughs> about my safety. Uh, so basically the task of a musician is to be able to find or create their own meaning and convey it. So as an example, we can take just random notes. For example, we, I, I have just random notes. That's not a music yet because I didn't uh, assign a meaning to it. I didn't interpret these notes. I just hit them somehow. But if I would play them, for example, That's a weird music, I agree. But nevertheless, you can feel some character or, for example, like that. That's just another character. It's still a weird music, but nevertheless, you can feel some character. You can feel that this music means something. So basically, if we strive to be good musicians, we shouldn't think that we need just most genius pieces in order to uh, unleash our creativity. We must be able to create uh, beautiful experiences from whatever we play. For those of you who want to continue learning about principles of uh, piano playing technique and expressiveness, uh, please check out the link in the description. Have fun playing piano and see you next time.